Can Sellers Conference, Day 3, Session 2.
on presence of space and time and experience. I guess you would like to start with some introductory? Uh, yeah, just a couple of short things. You'll notice the paper was very short. This is because it wasn't intended to answer anything. It was intended to incite discussion. And to those of you who are here on Friday, I think some of it will seem like a probably familiar discussion. I'm sure we'll be rehashing some of the things uh, that were just uh, rooted about in the first session on, on Friday and on this is paper. Um, I do apologize for the self-citations. I hate it when people do that, but I found since I was trying to be quick, I did it too much myself. Um, so um, I find, I guess the, the, the basic points are that I find um, what I have called Seller's phenomenological perceptual principle, this idea that when you um, ostensibly see something that is red and rectangular, then somehow something red and rectangular, or something somehow red and rectangular in physical space is present before you, uh, or present to you, I guess, um, other than is believed in. Um, I find that sort of intuitively compelling, but um, I'm also embarrassed to say that I struggle to find some way to defend it, other than saying, well, I find it intuitively compelling, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is, not a, is not a really strong defense, particularly since I actually don't think that intuition in the sense of the you know, sort of insight into the truth is a, a, a viable philosophical method. So, so one of the things I'm hoping is that is that you know someone will say something that'll uh, spur me to either have a better idea why I believe it or find it intuitive or maybe convince me that it isn't. Um, and then I also spend some time um, looking at John's um, alternative view of how space and time show up uh, in our experience, uh, because he claims to dispense with. Um, Seller's two aspect uh, or two part view of, of perception, and um, I, I've always struggled to try and understand um, what how John's uh, suggestion is really going to work. So I'm hoping to get some enlightenment there um, as well, and and so that's what I'm trying to incite a discussion on. So I'm going to stop. Good. Before I'm asking for hands, would you like to respond somewhat directly or um, open the discussion? Okay, I'm torn. I'm, I, 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 I'd say one really simple uh, and I hope quite quick thing. Um, uh, somewhere around the middle of the paper, uh, Bill, um, you, you protest against my saying that for sellers, sensations are exhaustively characterizable without reference to blah, 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 blah. Right. And, and um, you perfectly rightly say there's a whole lot more that you can say about sensations according to sellers. Um, um, maybe this is too quick, but uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, maybe I'm not entitled to it, but the, 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 what I want to say is all I meant was um, for sellers, uh, um, sensations... On, do not have um, uh, characterizations of their intrinsic nature that use intentional notions. So, so all I was well, meant to okay. be getting at was, was the point that Sellers is getting at when he, the, the thought that Sellers is getting at, whether it's a point is another question, <laughs> uh, when he says um, in locutions such as sensation of red, right. you need to be off. really careful about what that of is doing. Um, it, what it isn't doing is um, uh, anything like what Ov is doing in locutions like thought of a celestial city, okay, where, right. where that does yes. introduced. And I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sorry about the exhaustively characterizable, etc. Um, that, that was meant to um, put in place uh, a distinctively Salazian reading uh, of uh, how to. Um, think of sensations as the lump that ca characterizable in the way Kant characterizes them. And the modifications of okay. the subject state, right. uh, yeah. which I, uh, uh, I recognize that so, one, yeah. yeah. I guess so, what, I, what I was worried about was that you were trying to um, emphasize that, that you know, they're mere abstractions, they're not really suitable for, as Sellers thinks ultimately they could be, mm -hmm. uh, uh, treatment in a scientific uh, 
uh, uh, theory, you know, develop a, 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 a theory about what sensations are in us and how they fit into the rest of the uh, physical reality. And I was afraid that you were trying to exclude that, um, yeah, fairly early on by, by that characterization. No, but I'm, I'm not rejecting the idea that um, our sensory experience has a sensory aspect. Okay. Um, if you like, right. two, two aspects. You said that in the introductory remarks, um, a sensory aspect and an intentionality-involving aspect. Um, I, what, what I'm querying is the thought that uh, these two aspects have to come apart in the kind of way. So, so um, um, you know, sure, uh, right. th- th- there's a, 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 a topic for scientific investigation if you want to go in for this kind of thing. Um, um, the, the, the sensory aspect of our, for instance, color experience. Yeah. But, but our, what our color experience is, is experience of color, and now that's intentionality, the intentionality involving color. Or seemingly. So uh, if I can say one more thing, I mean, about the, 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 I forgot what you call the principle, but I mean, the thing that gets you, though, somehow in some way. Right. Um, it, what always strikes me about Sellers' introduction of that kind of locution, um, which uh, he thinks is needed um, for uh, talking about a, a topic that you can put in place using the word ostensibly or ostensible. Mm-hmm. Ostensible perceivings. Um, the, the sensory aspect of ostensible perceivings has to be captured like that. Um, it always seems to me that he's um, not appreciating the power of a concept that he himself makes a lot of fuss about and it says illuminating things about um, the concept of seeming right so uh, uh, an right. ostensible perceiving is either a perceiving act, an actual perceiving or a seeming perceiving and uh, uh, starting there you can get um, that the only kind of presence of sensibles to subjects needed for accommodating ostensible perceivings is um, cases of actual presence of sensibles um, in uh, conceptually informed experience or seeming cases of that (laughs) Um, seeming cases of of, uh, um, presence to conceptually informed experience there doesn't need to be an actual presence in the case of the, of the, of the merely seeming perceptual presence. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, I guess I, 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 think I, I do know that that's, what, that, that that's where you want to go, and I guess, um, you know, that word seems can move around. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's kind of this concept, that's the... Well, yeah, but, 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 but where it goes makes a difference, mm-hmm. and... and um, I guess I'm. I, I, I do believe that that in a seeming perception, uh, an ostensible perception, um, it's one in in which, as it were, it's at least possible that from from my side, I can't. You know, if I'm having it, I can't tell the difference. So that it's not it's not a seeming perception, as it were, as I. As it seems to me, <laughs> right? It is uh, a perception to me, which turns out to be merely a seeming. And 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 how do you account for its indistinguishability from a vertical perception? And that's why I I, I find that the idea that there's something somehow uh, like the perceivable uh, present to me uh, that 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 seems to me. Um, a reasonable way to to approach it. Good. Any hands? Okay. Johannes first. Um, well, I have to go back to that, but <laughs> it feels like we. <laughs> I mean, you made me, Bill. That's what I say. Um, one thing here is <coughs> that I think the, the ostensible here is a bit of a red herring with respect to the something somehow in Cuban 
physical space and so on. Mm-hmm. Because this something somehow should be there even in the non-ostensible case. And um, I do not okay. see that the ostensibility or the seeming is doing any work here. It is doing work, um, not for the phenological fact. It is doing work for the further step to say, oh, the very same thing that has been there in veridical perception seems to be uh, there as well Mm -hmm. in the case of non-veridical perception, i.e. the... Seems to be there. That that is probably the the, the (laughs) main... uh, It would be one... one, I mean, (laughs) as I said... This is the direction of, 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 of mm-hmm. the, the question here is the direction of the argument. Um, do you start with this as a phenomenological fact, or do you end up with that in always reading the ostensible already in the sentence, in the, in the, in the formulation, um, and um, hence connecting it to the conclusion of the sense impression inference? And um, it can do only work in. Uh, it can only do the work it is supposed to do in, in Saras, I think, um, if one gets a weak reading of the ostensibility in this case, gets thrown, thrown out, and say, okay, even in the Veridic case, mm-hmm. something somehow other is believed in. Of course, in the Veridic right. case, it could very well be the properties of microscopical and um, physical objects in physical space. No doubt about that. Nobody tries to say that's different um, but still even then you would have this very fact which he takes to be a phenomenological fact that something somehow other than believed in as merely believed in is there and so on so, so I don't really see um, that um, the seeming My. question at this point of the argument enters into the considerations and I would yet have to be convinced that it does mm-hmm. Okay, right. So, so uh, put slightly differently, the, the point is that look, uh, he still believes that uh, even even in a vertical perception, of course, there is something somehow red and rectangular present to me, other than is believed in, and that's for him the difference between uh, a merely thinking of a red rectangle and a perceiving of a red rectangle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's true. I think that makes a difference for John's reply, but I may be mistaken. Um, can, uh, um, other than as merely believed in uh, figures in some of these formulations, um, but um, I, I think that's kind of inept anyway. Um, what he's driving at is, I would say, otherwise uh, than as figuring in uh, the a specification of the intentional object of what we're talking about, which is an experience. Um, and and um, I think you really need uh, the mere seeming case uh, in order to make it look compulsory to bring that in. I mean, if we, if, if, if we forget about the fact that you can merely seem to perceive something red and just focus on, say, a case of actually perceiving something, <coughs> but perceiving it to be red, right? Um, uh, um, a, a, a case of redness is present to the perceiver in the experience. Um, so far as we've got so far, the, the only presence that, that you could so much as seem to need uh, is a presence that is captured by saying, uh, wait, the word red figures in a specification of the intentional content of this, this experience. Yeah. Uh, there's no need to bring in another mode of presence. Yet, there seems to be a, a, a need to bring in another mode of presence. Uh, once we move to merely seeming perceivings of something red, and then insist that um, uh, there's got to be something actually, a, a case of actual presence in common between uh, that and the uh, case of perceiving and merely seeming to perceive. Uh, as Bill says, I mean, in order to account for the possibility of taking a seeming perceiving to be a perceiving, which of course that's that's in there, but the idea of seeming. So I don't think it's right that um, uh, ostensible is doing no work in, in what makes this um, story about something that has to be true uh, uh, 
seem right. If we didn't have to think about merely seeming perceivings of red, then uh, the only the only, it would be there, there wouldn't be any ground for saying. Well, Ed Bill thinks there's ground, but I don't think there would be any ground for saying um, we need another presence. I, I'm worried over about over and that. above uh, a, 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 um, a presence for thought. Uh, Sellers is allusion to scholastic ways of thinking. It has no content. So it's merely linguistic content. Yeah. Not really, um, I mean, no. you have this, no. you, you just made this by, I, I would show no, the premise I'm, that there is Content an, as in Sellers' own line in EPM. But experiences, as it were, make claims. But look, I mean, he's also got the line in EPM where, where he, um, you know, it's almost a throwaway mark, but he says that uh, the real test of a theory of thinking is its theory of thinking in presence. Uh, because you know, thinking in absence has always got challenges. How do you, do, you know, yeah. uh, think about something when right. it isn't anywhere yeah. in the neighborhood and blah blah blah? Yeah. But I take it that that part, part, one of the lessons there is, and, and this is what I'm afraid you're 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 falling into, is that when you're focusing solely on thinking in presence, you're letting the mere presence itself do a lot of the work mm-hmm. um, that, in fact, ultimately makes it impossible to sort of project your theory on into uh, absence uh, thinking as well. Um, and and, and I, I'm worried but that... I, I that don't want to stop with... with um, well, so, so when you think about thinking... But that's the... The issue comes up uh, once we've got uh, the class of things that we're thinking about specified as ostensible perceiving. Uh, which include both perceivings and merely seeming perceivings. Um, uh, um, it, it's quite right that we need to <laughs> sort of register that there is that okay. um, kind that we can place experiences in, uh, ostensible perceiving. Let's say ostensible perceivings of red, just keep it. Um, and, and then the whole question is whether uh, um, the... the um, uh, move from thinking about perceivings to moving to thinking about a kind of thing that includes them and also includes merely seeming perceivings requires a new mode of presence in our picture Um, as opposed to that mode of presence that was already in the picture when we weren't yet thinking like this Uh, and then cases of seeming cases of that Right. Um, so where Sellers says there's got to be an actual presence uh, of redness. Um, why not say um, what there is is a seeming? I mean, in the case where, where, where there's no actual presence for thought, what there is is a seeming presence for thought. Um, it's no seeming, seeming does the, does the work. Uh, that he, yeah. And there are two fingers, Jim and Mark. Well, what I was going to say has, I think, been said by John very clearly. <laughs> but on the other hand, it's, it's, Go ahead, it's, it's not clear, you know, <laughs> that there's any agreement about this. Maybe it's worth trying to say again. I mean, and you even said it in kind of the way, I would say. But, um, <laughs> but, so but, go ahead and be redundant. I'll be redundant. I mean, but maybe <laughs> just doing it very briefly, because that would be helpful. I mean, in veridical sensory consciousness, um, there is something that is present to us. We have presence to sense, you know, a sensory consciousness of an object. And it seems like an unpacking of that idea of sensory consciousness of an object is going to have both an intentional and a sensory aspect, to use Jones. We're not going to have our topic unless it has both of those aspects. And then for various purposes, we can focus on one or the other, you know, abstract um, way or consider about certain fun cases. But, um, but it does seem like as long as we're thinking about veridical sensory consciousness of an, aspect, of, of an object, there's one notion of presence there that has two aspects. Um, and unless we somehow create a category that works the way ostensible seeing works in sellers, which I take to be different than merely ostensible, category of ostensible seeing, you know, is supposed to be inclusive and include those cases in something else, um, I don't see um, any way, till we expand in that way, to even have, you know, the appearance of an obligation to not just distinguish two different aspects of such presence, but to have two different modes of presence, which are now distributed over each of those aspects. Seems like 
what pushes you to say that is to say something that there's not just something generically in common between the veridical and the non-veridical case, but you want to say there is a thing present, mm -hmm. even though the thing that your, your thought was intentionally picking out isn't there anymore, which is present in both cases. And so now we have a mode of presence, which is common to the two cases, the hallucination, the veridical perception. And, and that does seem to me to involve some dubious thinking, if, if that's the way it's going. But um, we could we could say if it involves dubious thinking or not. But I do think this is I was coming where Johannes first said if we don't if we don't have that wide category if we are just considering the veridical case then I don't really see how just considering that case there's any intellectual pressure to move from two aspects of the mode of presence to a mode of presence for each aspect. It seems well, like we well, need the expanded Bill, category. And so I, in this sense, I'm agreeing with yeah. Bill mm -hmm. that he needs to be considering that wider class mm -hmm. to even have the pressure to move to that claim. I have my worries about how that works, but I think you're right that we need that. To Bill just pressure. gave us another aspect. He said he, he contrasted thinking of uh, uh, presence and thinking of absence. Mm -hmm. And why yeah. is it not to distinguish the aspect in question enough? Why is it not enough to uh, distinguish this something somehow as well, um, to distinguish those two cases. You don't need the seeming case, right, 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 you exactly. need those two cases, and already you have what mm -hmm. you want, mm -hmm. an innocent phenomenological fact. Why do you not have it there? Because you have I'm thinking yeah. with a sensible aspect, and you have the thinking without a sensible aspect. I don't think that yeah. shows that yeah. there's a different mode of presence. Well, the, one but here, the try this one. Um, an aspect, maybe. Uh, uh, why does it have so a different mode of presence? Right? I mean, take contrast. Yeah. I see the car from, you know, the, remember Terminator 1, where various things would happen, and he'd get little lines of text in front of him. Uh, so imagine somehow the cup bangs into me, and I get a line of text. There's a cup on the, on, on the table. That's really bloody different. The cup is present to me differently there if it's just giving me a line of text that I, that I understand in as much way as you want. That seems to me perfectly sufficient. That, that does just as much because it precisely, you know, it, you're, you're saying that the uh, uh, non veridical case... I'm not saying we can't give sense to the phrase different mode of presence. That's not the idea of a merely sensory mode of presence that's been completely short of an intellectual aspect. Um, that, that, that's what we need for these particular... That is still, to use Kant's language, something that's going to fall in the realm of a possible object of experience. And as long as it's a possible object of experience, it's going to involve both of these aspects. The honest claim was that, 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 that the difference... That, 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 that the... Not merely as the object of belief. Right. Presence as not merely the object of belief was a separate thing, and that you didn't need to talk about ostensible cases to get that idea. Mm -hmm. And right. it seems to me completely... I'm just missing yeah, something. Yeah, which idea? The idea we're trying to get is the, object, the idea of a mode of presence, which is merely sensory. All right, can, can I make Those a suggestion? Well, you've changed your suggestion. May I make... I'm going to... Yeah, okay, so I'm going to make a suggestion. Um, we've been treating the word seems as if it is on sort of... Um, uh, uh, univocal everywhere, but it, but it seems to me um, <laughs> that in fact there may be two different senses here. Maybe that's part of the idea. After all, we can say things like it seems to me the Red Sox are going to win this series next year as well. Right now, that can be a perfectly good seeming, um, but of course it's not a perceptual seeming at all. Um, and so I was thinking, take the case where you're looking at, at um, something that's in a familiar illusion, like the Mueller liar, right? On the one hand, it makes good sense to say, well, it seems to me that the lines are different, have different lengths. On the other hand, it can also make sense to say, well, it seems to me that, in fact, you know, someone asks you, it seems to me that they're the same length. I know this trick. Uh, you've been pulling this on me before, and they're the same damn length. And now, it seems to me sensorily that they're different, but... I believe, assuming that you're not trying to su subtly trick me, so I'm not going to fully endorse it, that in fact they're the same length. Uh, it seems to me you can say they, it seems to me that they're the same length and it seems to me that they're not the same length with a slightly different twist on the seeming there, and that makes sense because the one seeming is a straightforward withholding of endorsement from um, a purely declarative claim, and the other seeming is a sensory seeming. 
Uh, and it's a different, and then it, that makes sense only because there are two different ways in which these things can seem to me. That's a misuse of English, I think, Bill. I, think, <laughs> I, mean, I, think, I think when you're in on the Can we take a poll on that? <laughs> well, let me just stop you. When you're in on the trick, a much more natural look, like you should is, it looks as if and continues to look as if, but it no longer seems to me that. And I think steam has a judgmental implication that looks, looks as if is much more mm -hmm. the sensory, I think, if you were to speak exactly. John is... Good. Yeah. Nothing no, no, this Oxonian no. point is probably <laughs> says something about that. Well, like, you know, it's a difference in America, damn it. I, I think it's a big It just gets up. But you know it is. We could do it once. I know what it is. I suppose it looks to me as if. I want to join in on, on um, yeah. accusing Bill of not being able to speak his native tongue. <laughs> <laughs> where I think this is going is um, something. No, I can't um, speak your native tongue. <laughs> we, we should be thinking about the section of EDM called the logic of looks. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, exactly. And, and oh, yeah. in what we've got there is, is um, a, to begin with an image, a metaphor. Um, visual experiences, as it were, make claims. And that's, um, but it's got to be cashed out, the metaphor, but uh, it, it, that's the core of the account of how to understand looks claims. Looks claims, right? Um, um, looks claims describe experiencing. Uh, in terms of the claims that they, the experiencings, as it were, make. Uh, and in the Müller layer, uh, you have a visual experience that, as it were, makes the claim these lines are yeah, right. of that's unequal right. length, yeah. and you know better than to accept the <laughs> um, experience, um, as it were, tells you, purports to tell you these lines are of unequal length. And that's the and point you, about you, know, you know not to get told. But that's um, an um, that's the, that's the, uh, and then um, that's a context in which to place an understanding of. You're right, start with um, thinking in presence. Um, the ridicule doesn't do it, right, because the, um, the, 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 the good cases are cases where experience gives you to know uh, that things are the way it, as it were, claims they are. And, and just things being that way isn't enough for experience to give you to know that. Yes. Start with cases where experience gives you to know that things are, as it, as it were, claims that they are. Um, there's a, a base case um, of uh, um, say visual presence uh, to a subject of experiencing of sensibles, uh, which sensibles well, it depends on what the experience is, is described as, as it were claiming. That gives you the base case. Um, uh, that is not presence otherwise than... I mean, the, the locutions, are, I, I'm happy, but what they are obviously getting at is otherwise than as part of the content. Uh, um, but, but this presence is not presence otherwise than as part of the content. It's presence as part of what you spell out in saying, what it is that the experience, as it were, claims. Yeah, right? I think there's a fairly clear cut response to that. Experiences are mm -hmm. not merely claims. Experiences are mm -hmm. claims that make, as it were, claims, and, and that's yeah. an important mm -hmm. lesson mm -hmm. to be drawn from, but they are not mere claims, and that's all. No, because they're, they're practice, experiences, and they then that's that they also have uh, a sensory, right? It wouldn't, it wouldn't be an experience Absolutely. unless it was in a sensory way that it was making this claim. Um, Jim's talk of... In a sensory way, yeah. So why could I not sort of... I mean, all there is, is, is it possible to concentrate in the required sense on this sensory aspect, maybe, or a sensory mm -hmm. way, a specific kind of sensory making a claim as opposed to yeah. making it in the Terminator way? The, your, your response... And, 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 and if I have to, why, why is that not enough? It is not enough, certainly not, for the sense impression inference. Certainly not. No, no, I didn't sure. claim that. That's what you're calling the sense impression Yeah, well, I'm okay. Right. <laughs> That's the inference to yeah. this, the mm. thing that Bill is calling the whatever it is. Yeah, I know, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. I, the, the problem I have with it is that, is that your response seemed to assume that we, we should treat all seams and appearance words in general uh, on the model of um, the, the, you know, uh, 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 the logic of looks in EPM. But Sellers does say in, in uh, Structure of Knowledge, I forget exactly 
I think it's the first lecture, um, that he grants to Chisholm the, that we do have a non-comparative use of, of, of appearance words. And in my little story about the Muller liar, um, the, it's, they seem to be different lengths. I would, be, I would say that's actually a non-comparative use of the, where they appear to be different lengths. That would be a non-comparative use and not one of these endorsement uh, holding ones, at least not directly, so that they're actually the, the, the admission of the non-comparative uh, use of appearances turns out to be important for him for maintaining the distinction between uh, the, these two different modes of presence because they, there are two different ways in which things can seem in those modes of presence. So that's The genus is just backing off and there's lots of ways you can back off the, 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 full, the full perceptual judgment case. I'm not, sure that, I'm not sure that the, the non-comparative use is backing off. I don't believe that. The, 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 the genus is cases where it tells a story about the logic of looks, fits. Um, so, so um, not just a, not any old backing off from endorsing some claim um, counts. Uh, yes. the, the cases that we should be focusing on counts are as cases well. where counts as relevant to getting oh, the sure. sense of what Sellers means by ostensible sure. perceiving. Oh, of course. That's we should be focusing on cases where um, uh, Sellers' story of, about the logic of looks fits. So we should be focusing on experiencing that as it were claim something and, and restrict to claim something involving um, proper and common sensibles of the relevant sense uh, proper sensibles of the relevant sense common sensibles uh, and, and now it could be visual experiencings focus on visual experiencings um, and Sellers does this all, not just in that section in the uh, um, Think of some claim involving, um, uh, I'll say, presence right, of uh, um, visual sensibles. We can, and then we think about a color. Uh, here's a here's a class of experiences, um, uh, experiences that, as it were, claim that an instance of that is out there, present, present to the perceiver. Um, and now we've got a sensible perceivings of that. Um, this isn't just any old use of seeming, right? I mean, it's, it's, right. It's, 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 but looks <laughs> as right, but helpfully discussed by sellers in that section of EPM. And now, um, right, but but he does acknowledge explicitly room for a couple of different uses of seems and a couple of different oh, uses sure. of appear, don't, don't, appear don't, words and. Mm-hmm. And it seems to me that that, that might be... The point kicks in, that that's not relevant. No, to it's not relevant, but yeah. the bigger genus mm-hmm. that seems is not. Right. But, we, but, but then but the no, bigger genus is not. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. So let's move on to the next hand, or is there a thing on that? There's a hand. A new one. Yeah, Matt was first. Okay. Um, it, you know, it's more of the same. I'm not very sorry to say, but uh, disguised as a hand. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, right. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, but it's a question, perhaps from you know, further outside Sellerism or something. That uh, um, I've been struggling with the interpretation of this uh, proposition. Uh, something somehow a pink, a cube of pink in physical space is present and the perception other than is merely believed in. Um, it, seems, it seems like part of the disagreement here is depends on stronger and weaker readings of what that claim is. Uh, uh, it seems to me like Johannes is, is right, that if it merely means there is a difference between perceiving something and believing something, then it's not obvious to me that you need to refer to the case of ostensible seeing to see that that's the right distinction to draw. Um, uh, Per- perception has a vividness that okay. it does not. Uh, I, I, my understanding is that the position that Jim and John were taking was that they had a stronger reading of what the passage was committing us to, and that they were thinking that the case of ostensible seeing was necessary. It was necessary to refer to that in order to get this stronger claim about the something to do with the actuality of the cube. Mm-hmm. But so that. 
asking a little bit of a can you, can you just talk me into the Solarian picture as a way of way in here? Um, there's an equation that takes place over your page seven between three ideas, I guess. Um, right, you, you first quote Sellers. And uh, tell us proposition which the famous observation of the um, uh, Then you reformulate uh, something that, does, that has merely intentional inexistence. And then again you reformulate it and you say something that is non-conceptual. Right? Okay. Um, and people, people might, I mean you might think that insofar as there's a phenomenological data, it's uh, is only plausibly connected with some of those ideas and not others. So, you know, it, so the question is, uh, this is put as a, put as a phenomenological prin principle, right? It's meant to be something that somehow reflective articulation of what's manifest uh, requires us to concede. What, reflection of, what reflective articulation of what's manifest makes obvious to me is, is that there's a difference between uh, uh, having an object as a, as a topic of uh, thought and as a content of perception. Okay. I, I, I totally grant that. So, so, so maybe that's the right way to read the first remark about believing. Right? Believing is just a standing in for um, a mode of representation that's not vivid in the, the way that sensible uh, perceptual presence is. Now, I mean, in the you know long-standing usage of the idea of in intentional, I mean that that wouldn't be a distinction between the intentional and the non-intentional. It'd be a distinction between two modes of intentionality, I guess. Right? I mean, if you were Brentano, you would say, you know, that uh, perception has its mode of intentionality, um, and uh, <coughs> uh, thought or belief has its. So, so now here's a reason I can think of for for making the transition to not intentional. It would be to emphasize. Uh, a claim that there must actually mm -hmm. be something pink, uh, right? And then we would be off to the races, I think, with this problem which Johannes was drawing our attention to, of the relationship between pink as ascribed wherever there's seeming perceptual presence, and uh, pink as ascribed to uh, cubes in actual mm -hmm. space. Um, but I, I don't see that that's a bit of the phenomenological datum. Uh, so question one, did Sellers think it was? Question two, if so, why? Uh, um, question three, how do you motivate it? Yeah, right, I guess, yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, he, d he does, in fact, use, I, I guess I don't see that he, I've got those actual quotes, but he does actually use the word, you know, actual, and talk about the actuality of the... Uh, of the, the the pinkness and the and the cubicity and even in some the spatiality. Uh, well, okay, so so yes, he does think he is argue, committed to that those being it. actually present. Mm -hmm. But you have to get also. I think it's 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 important to make sure that you understand, as it were, where the parentheses are, as it were, with those quantifiers. Right? It's a, mm -hmm. it's something somehow a cube of pink in physical space. Right, mm -hmm. and and sound on Friday it sounded like sometimes people were reading that as somehow a cube of pink. End parenthesis in physical space, and of course that's just wrong, uh, because while in a veridical perception, yes, the cube of pink will be out there in physical space. If you're hallucinating uh, a pink cube, uh, you'll still have something somehow a cube of pink in physical space present to you, but it won't, of course, be in physical space. It will be in a somehow physical space, right? So you have to get the, the grouping into well, No, I, I understand yeah. that. I wasn't meaning right. to make trouble about that. I, I just it seems to me that if the claim involves this actuality claim, right. uh, then the point that I think Johannes and Mark and you, maybe you two are, are rightly consisting on, that you can, you can get into view the, the, the manifest distinction between perception and uh, you know, merely having the words appear on your screen, right? or you know, uh, representation in some non-vivid sense. That doesn't suffice. To get us the, the uh, that, that, that's where right. I, I would think. Well, but uh, of course, 
to be a good Solardian, I, I, I'd have to say, look, I'm really worried about the idea that uh, the difference here is one uh, in vividness. Um, the difference between my perception of, a, uh, of, of the pink cube and my belief that there's a pink cube there uh, is not merely one of vividness. That, uh, you know, was that was Hume's that problem. Very right? casually, but, uh, the, well, but the, 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 take the Brentano way of drawing the distinction. Right? There are two modes of intentionality. Right? They're, they're distinct as modes. It's not that one is on a continuum with the other in terms of vividness. The real, the real thought is um, there's perceptual intentionality and there, there's, there's the intentionality of thought. Um, okay, that labels the problem nicely, but now, but now what? Right, um, and you know, Sellers does you know and develop uh, you know a, a fairly decent theory of of the intentionality of thought, right? Lingua form and you know blah blah blah. But then the question is, what he you know he warns us against assuming that the intentionality of sense is the intentionality of thought, um, and what does that really amount to? Well, well now, what, now what is a good question? But why this? That's what I'm asking. Um, right. Um, yeah. Well, well why, we're, we're why, back to my why, problem that why, I raised, why, right? Why, I find I find the principle intuitively, you know, intuitively attractive, and I, but I don't, I you know, you ask a question that I have trouble uh, articulating a, a response to, other than, yeah, it seems right, <laughs> and and I'm unhappy with that, uh, and so I was hoping. Rather than just getting a bunch of challenges on that, I would hope someone would say something that would say, "Oh, okay, now I see." Uh, but I'm, I'm not there yet. But in fact, oh, I mean, what you were just referring to, I mean, that's really helpful because um, this other mode of intentionality is, I think, all he needs at that point. Because what he now does is, um, and that's where, of course, the ostensibility is kicking in. He's saying, "Okay, this mode of." Um, of intentionality can be present in different cases. And maybe one doesn't want to go there, but okay, now we say okay, it can be present in this case, in this case, and in this case. There is an hallucination and very case. And now they do not seem to be relevantly different to us. So here's something we ought to explain. And um, I do not think, I, I never intended to to defend this because I'm really not that convinced of that move, but I think that is the move that is there. It's not simply like, okay, now we take the actual out of there, and then we, uh, with respect to actuality, independent of this being an intentional content, we think about it in hallucination and illusion, because that is not something that would be possible, according to Sellers, because everything has to be, of course, conceptually <coughs> shaped, and that means intentionally shaped in so far as it is conscious. <coughs> so we could do that other by way of <coughs> an explanatory inference. And um, that, is, that is the whole... But, but the, the key, I mean, I thought what we were arguing about <coughs> was whether in what we're explaining here we need to focus on what the two sensory, you know, two sensory modes have a time. See, if, if, we're just, if we're just focusing on thought of something versus, you know, sensory, you know, something being given in sensation, then the only thing we've got in common is something, you know, that's specified, you know, in terms of the thought dimension, you know. So we're not going to find, we're, we're not, that's not going to, you know, mm -hmm. yield any pressure to two actualities that are common at the level of sense. It seems like you get that by focusing on two cases of sensing, um, both of which have something common in terms of the specification of the content, but you want to say they don't just have something common at the level of the intentional content, but they also must have something common in their sensory aspect, and the right way to understand what they have common in their sensory aspect is something common that is present to sense in both cases, regardless of what else is the case. No, and to get that, it seems like we need to we need but to that be was considering not the claim. The claim was that in this this way of being um, intentionally sensory present, as we have it in an experience, it's intentional through and through, of course. This is um, the intentionally informed sensory consciousness that Sellers has, and John thinks he doesn't have, okay. But um, if it is, then there is a, uh, an inference to an explanation 
And this is invoking <coughs> sensations. And sensations are no earlier invoked than with this. I mean, you, but what you now just did is that you said, okay, as long as it's thought, we don't have a problem at all. In a way, that is right, because not insofar as it is thought. No, I meant if insofar as the two things we're comparing is a sensing of such and such and a merely believing of such and such, there's no need to, there isn't any pressure as far as I can see to parse the way things are thought in the sensory that forces us on, I, I, on us the idea of something which is presence to sense which has to be cast out distinctly from what it is for something to be present to both aspects at once. Um, um, yeah, I mean obviously there's a difference but, but, but we want to make a certain kind of move and, and, and that, it's hard to see I, I have trouble seeing what even pushes that move unless we're reflecting on different kinds of presence to sense where we say these cl this class you know qua presences to sense have something in common and what they have in common should be understood in terms of a common actuality mm -hmm. relative to sense um, other than that I don't see what pushes it please allow John to tell you well I was just going to say um, something seemed to me to be beginning to go wrong when you Johannes mm -hmm. um, uh, suggested that you could simply take on board um, yeah. Matt's idea. Let's think. Let's think like Brentano. Mm -hmm. um, two modes of mm -hmm. intentionality. Um, I think the whole point of what Sellers wants to say about, uh, and now this is neutral language, the sensory aspect mm -hmm. of um, perceptual or ostensibly perceptual mm -hmm. experiencing, is that it's n there's no intentionality to it. That's the whole point. Uh, there is no intentionality to, to that. It, um, the, 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 the Brentano idea of a, a right, sensory or perceptual mode of intentionality uh, belongs with a, 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 some thought like um, thought is a very compendious concept. Um, insofar as intentionality belongs to the objects of thought we have to note that um, experiencing is a mode of thinking right <laughs> um, so um, uh, 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 Brentano perceptual or intentional or whatever, uh, uh, sensory intentionality is what Sellers is um, it, it is some basic thought about um, the sensory aspect of experiencing. There's no intentionality in the truth about that. We can focus on the truth about that by itself. So whatever you say about um, the, the, this language for um, capturing the sensory aspect, it isn't... There isn't peace between you and Matt speaking for, for Brentano. You can't say, oh, yes. I, I grew um, up that there isn't peace between us mm -hmm. the way you would tell us. <laughs> Matt, right. and because this is not, uh, his core belief is, is, doesn't seem to me to be represented in the right way. I just said very, very quickly that, uh, so suppose you went with this Brentano picture where there are two, mm -hmm. two modes of intentionality, right? And then you observed uh, that in the case of perceptual intentionality it can be present both where there's actually a pink ice cube and where there isn't right mm -hmm. nothing would straight away follow about uh, right I mean int intentionality in general is something that tolerates the absence of its object yeah. so, mm -hmm. so there'd be our characterization of the thing would have supplied yeah. what looks like a characterization of the sameness mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't require um uh, you know, descending to some other level, talking about something actual or whatever. The, the mm -hmm. same is that they, mm -hmm. they both perceptually intend to pink ice cube. Mm -hmm. um, and the Alf has the same logical grammar. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it does. Mm -hmm. But I thought our discussion was about, I thought John was raising a question about the aspect of sellers, which has to do with sellers wanting to say sensation. That's what I want to talk about. As a silly generous logical okay. grammar. And I would have thought that. Uh, Sellers entitling himself to that and his entitling himself to think Bill's interested in it, which I think does seem to be in Sellers, namely that there's a mode of actual presence to sense at the level of um, these two sensory experiences that get grouped together in the case of ostensible things are related topics. 
and, 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 and I take it Matt's point is there isn't anything in the Mir Brentano idea that, that gives you any pressure to move there. The offness of sensation is different. That's true. That's, that's, that is absolutely true. That is the offness of sensation as it is inferred by the sense impression inference as the, an explanatory ontology, ontological point. Then sense impressions are of whatever, red or what have you, but they are introduced by abstracting from the sensory aspect qua of the experience, qua intentional mode of perception. And that's different. We do not have consciousness of sense impressions. He's very clear about that. And insofar as we can have consciousness of them, they are twice removed. Mike, I just want to follow up on what Johanna said, though, because I think it makes it more problematic. Than, um, I'm not even convinced that they are introduced by abstraction. And I, this was how little I understand Sellers on this was brought home to me recently by reading Jay Rosenberg on Salazian picturing where he has a very interesting account of animal representation mm -hmm. and it, it, he's not really talking initially about sensation there at all but it seems to me that what he says about the kind of tracking relation that really sensations on Sellers view stand into the environment um, would, would, would actually be a perfect it would make the theory of picturing particularly as exhibited in the imaginary language John Blee's, um, a perfectly good account of the kind of iconic representing that um, sensations do um, because um, Jay beautifully brings out the distinction between pictorial complexity and logical complexity that are modes of aggregation that are not logical conjunctions so you can represent in the pictorial way many aspects of, of, of the scene around um, but without logical operators and therefore without propositionality in the, uh, in the full sense and the things combined um, so if you look at it like that um, there's actually no connection between sensations and any phenomenology. I mean, a animals who don't have a phenomenology can represent in the way sensations as functionally introduced with uh, reliable but not um, in inviolate causal relations to uh, the, the environment and then intrinsic characteristics which are simply exemplified in functional exclusion relations. Um, so you can't be off red and off green at the same time and, 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 and you can build on that a kind of pseudo-inferentiality but it's got nothing to do with, 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 with entailment or anything like that you can do computations on them basically um, and uh, there's no link from this generic concept of representation to anything phenomenological the, the, the sensory presence of the, of, of the thickness of the pink ice cube and Sellers does seem to think that once he's introduced sensations in this functional way, he's done so in a, in, in a, he's also, as it were, given as a link to the phenomenology, perhaps via the idea that in some sense they're common to veridical and non-veridical cases. But of course that doesn't do it. Uh, and, um, and so... It just, I feel a lot of this discussion has been, has been bypassing some of the issues that Sellers raises, namely that his account of sensation itself um, is so functional and so disconnected from our perception as he himself says. And by the way, it comes out very clearly in spatiality, which Bill introduces and then um, moves over to color. Um, Rosenberg points out, uh, it seems to be quite correctly, you don't want to give the content of animal spatial representation in a way that looks even remotely like the possession of the first person pronoun or token reflexes. Right. And, and, and Rosenberg has an account of what he calls pure positional awareness, in which presumably the animal <coughs> representational state, I mean they instantiate the map, and, and the mode of representation involves some kind of triangulation of environmental landmarks. Um, which enables them to locate themselves and orient towards those uh, landmarks and recompute as they, as they move. There's no phenomenology here. There doesn't have to be. The generic notion is independent of phenomenology. And yet, 
everybody's talking about sensory presence, but the generic definition of this non-intentional, as Johannes so correctly points out, this non-intentional mode of representation doesn't underwrite a notion of presence without further specification of what supposedly is going on in the human case. But I don't see that further specification in Sellers. There's some casual remarks in science and metaphysics where he says they're in a way conscious. But if you want to know what that means, I think you'll wait an awfully long time. And because yeah, have to read it. Um, so I think the diff- that it's very difficult for me. But perhaps I, I, this is a cry for help. I used to think I understood this, and I don't. It's very difficult for me to even relate the generic account of non-intentional representation to any issue about the phenomenology of sensory consciousness. I know Stellas thinks there's a relationship, but I don't see it. Um, this is this is a groping first try, but but uh, are you do you think that there needs to be some kind of relationship between um, the sensory as such and the phenomenology? I mean, because it's experiences that have phenomenological characteristics, right? But experiences are always more than than sensations. Having a sensation doesn't guarantee you any. Uh, phenomenology uh, until it becomes uh, part of an experience, and that it does by being conceptualized, right? So, so you don't but the experience, but, sensations. But, but now, but now I'm losing it, Bill. I mean, you're the one who's got the phenomenological principle, and if we've been talking about sensations, and that's supposed to be in some way the added element that mere thought doesn't have, at least that's the way Sellers talks anyway, the way I read him superficially as I do. Well, but I mean, doesn't that have to do with, <laughs> with how um, how it is that, I mean, and this is, this is you know, uh, just putting the label on a big problem, I think, but how it is exactly that the sensation is a part of the experience. I mean, the experiences for him are, 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 are complex things, right? They've got a conceptual aspect, no, a sensory it's aspect. Worse, it's worse than that. It's far yeah. worse than that. It's the way that they're... Intru- How much worse than that? It's the way that <laughs> sensation is introduced as non-intentional makes it look as if it couldn't be the sort of thing that could be, quote, part of the experience. I mean, it can't just be, it cannot just, see, John talks unashamedly of shapings of sensory consciousness. It cannot be that that consists of, as it were, a kind of claiming in the context of this non apperceived functionally defined state. I think that's what John thinks. It, the the, the Salazian solution is passing by any even description of, the, of, of what we're trying to get at, much less any explanation. But in this paper, okay. um, Bill was referring to John's paper, he's very beautifully lining out um, set a complex story about image models and all that stuff. And he thinks that doesn't do the trick for reasons which might, might be disputed, but at least there's a taking up for Salas, it's all about taking up of sense impressions into consciousness and in so taking them up we are conceptually informing them but that is, <coughs> that is different that doesn't, that, doesn't, that doesn't make those things sort of um, thoughts themselves but it's, it is integrating those very sense impressions in um, whatever is the complex um, representation conscious representation of things as being in physical space and, and there, there, so there, there is a lot of maybe that doesn't do the trick for the reasons John points out in this paper but um, at least it is more than simply saying well yeah and then there's the sensations and somehow they are very very remote no, this is very important this is a, there's one finger back uh, in the room uh, I just, just a quick point you made this Pablo mentions the computation and animal perception and how somehow when an animal is having a sensory experience that's sort of more conducive to computation and somehow computation is lacking some phenomenological aspect and then the other side of this is okay non-computable or I, I don't want to say non-computable because that might have a technical sense but I'm, uh, could you elaborate on how computation and phenomenology is maybe two divisions like you're dividing things that are no, I, 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 I didn't make a division I, I just said the way that these things are introduced by Sellers, the way he discusses them in the paper on animal representation. They're just introduced functionally. 
so they have they have a kind of symbolic aspect to them and there are algorithms that operate on the symbols basically I mean Sellers is pre- assuming classical architecture of course um, but, but th- that, that conceptually that gives you no link in and of itself to anything to do with phenomenology I mean now Johannes wants to say there's a way in which you can make the link by you take these up into but for me that's just Sellers putting a name on, on what his view really doesn't enable us very easily to, to understand I mean I, I, I can accept it as perhaps identifying the problem but, but I can't accept it as a solution to it I mean, when I said I didn't understand Sellers I could rephrase it as I don't understand what the taking up can, you know, in other words I, I can just well, not disagree with you but mm-hmm. just say you've identified what I don't understand Mark? Well, just, just very quickly so, yeah, I mean surely the t- putting into the space of reasons is a non sequitur with regard to Michael's, it's, it's Michael's happy, yeah. problem I mean, if the sensation is introduced in this functional way as just the thing that serves to give us tracking relations to the world we know perfectly well that that can be implemented you know we've got all of these models from cognitive scientists who can implement that in incredibly simple systems that have nothing remotely like phenomenology little bugs and shit and then the it doesn't look like putting that into the space of reasons and making it conceptual is getting you phenomenology so I take the question to be yeah. where in the story is there something uh, phenomenal and you can say as an extra thing it gets taken up into consciousness but then the question is A, why does Sellers think that's important because he's now got tracking relations in the space of reasons isn't that all he wanted and B, what does it mean Sellers himself and, will do this with robots when he feels like it I mean to illustrate how it works questions are good questions I just deny that there aren't resources for us. Well, what are they? Well, one of them is, for instance, that we, um, as he, he constantly distinguishes between the order of being and the order of knowing. Um, it is for him an, a, 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 a viable option that things which are for animals merely uh, do not have any phenomenal um, dimension um, can, as we employ them um, have a phenomenal dimension for us or constitute, better to say constitute a phenomenal or uh, dimension for us, that would be I think the case in sense impressions the case for sense impressions is not merely tracking of course because um, if it would be only tracking as you suggested um, it uh, could be done otherwise with symbols and whatever, what have you so here we have another argument going from the argument for sense impressions does not simply consist in their tracking function, although the tracking function, as it turns out, is part of what sense impressions are able to do. But I didn't say sense impressions, I said sensations, I think they're not the same thing. They are not the same thing, but um, he is not talking about, uh, insofar as he talks about the offness of um, sensation that is explained by sense impressions, and they are ultimately, no. in the, in the, well, no, ultimately they are identified as something completely different, which is... Uh, Different both from sense impressions and from sensations, but that is not. I mean, if you have sensations in the in the in the if he uses sensations in the animal case, I and merely as tracking it, not as in the phenomenal sense, and then they are pretty much what sense impressions are. So I would argue for that, but we would have to. See. What what about what about Rosenthal's kind of view, where you've got these homeomorphic uh, properties instantiated in. Uh, the animal uh, that map certain aspects of the environment and bring them to consciousness to have a higher order thought about them. But see, then, then that's an interesting yeah. answer. That's an attempt to say that you actually. It, I mean, I, I, I of course you could just say you might happen to have. We might happen to do it this way, and isn't that neat? And, but that's kind of unsatisfying. This would be an attempt to say that you actually can't do some of the functional conceptual work unless it's got the structure of a phenomenal. Right. That would be a neat story, but that's no, I don't think that's anywhere in Wilfred. Um, I'm not so sure. I mean, David David does some, you know, so a nice job showing up. Well, put it this way, David argues that to the extent that it's not in Wilfred, it should be. <laughs> that is <laughs> fun. Yeah, and there's lots of things um, for which you can say that. Yeah, right. But but no, but he he can get you he can get you a fair way towards it, I think, before he has to make that leap of. And here's what he should have said as well. 
I, well, I mean, that's, that's what he did at the, at the, at the Dublin yeah. conference. I, I know. I didn't understand any of the parts where he was putting <laughs> it in Wilfred. I understood the story, but I didn't understand any of it. So Jim next, and then Joe. So there's a story. There, there's a story in Star Wars that kind of starts from some place <laughs> and moves on to consciousness. You know it. And there's another story in Star Wars where we start from consciousness and we work down. And the finger that points up and the finger that points down, I take it, are supposed to meet. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, and, and um, so um, so um, so our initial discussion, in which we're starting with various complex, intentionally and sensorily structured moments of, of perceptual consciousness, and then abstracting out what is supposed to be the sensory in them, is part of a methodological movement that involves the pointing down finger. The stuff that Michael's talking about, which is certainly there, where we have a certain story, a generic story about creatures whose responses are cued to the environment and in such a way that they track. It's the pointing down figure. One of these is not right and the other is yeah, not uh, wrong. Uh, they're uh, both uh, part of the story and they're supposed to meet. Now, the fact that Sellers calls the kind of tracking he's interested in our case, you know, the, 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 the nodes in this symbolic network, sensations isn't just misleading terminology. Um, it's, it's because it's supposed to, like, meet the finger coming down, which is focusing and trying to abstract out the stuff that already in phenomenological grounds, you know, we ha has traditionally been known as the sensory in philosophy. So these things are supposed to meet. Now, um, I don't think in Sellers that it's right about Sellers to say. He has nothing to say about how they meet. He wants these fingers to meet, and I think he has attempts to try to say how they meet at various points. Um, we spent a whole lot of our first workshop last year talking about one of those arguments, which I think has to do with this idea of external guidance in, um, you know, um, S&M, where, you know, he thinks, unless they meet, our very idea of a cognitive capacity is going to fall apart. If we're going to make sense of a capacity of knowledge, um, these things that figure as the sensory dimension here have to figure up with sensations this way, or we'll fall into a bad kind of idealism. We don't want to fall apart into a bad kind of idealism. Condition of adequacy of not doing that, these things must, you know, meet. Um, I confess I'm not persuaded by that argument. I, that argument seems to me to involve something like the minor premise. There is no other way to avoid catastrophe, so we must avoid it this way. That's a hard thing to show. There's no other way I don't think it. he shows the meeting, though, Jim. I, I, no, I agree with you. Yeah. He's committed. No, 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 I agree with you. I don't think he does either. I, I'm saying it's not that he has nothing to say about it. He has arguments right. that are supposed to. I'm mentioning one. I think his, his how he argues this is different at different stages. That argument turns on a premise. Um, there is no other door but this one, which I think is a false premise. And so it doesn't show what it's supposed to. But, 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 but I did think, you know, both parts of the story, the one we started by talking about, the one you've introduced, the, the, the movement from, a, from you know, within full-blown sensory consciousness down, and the one from some picture of what it would be to hooked up responsively to an environment where we can see a certain kind of responsive hookup as guided by the environment in a way that doesn't yet bring in intentionality, are supposed to meet. And he has arguments that try to show this, which I'm not convinced by. And... If one's not convinced by those arguments, then one can, this is just going back to the first part of the discussion, one can raise worries about whether that pointing finger that's pointing from above, below, penetrates as far as it's supposed to, whether it's picked out something which is two things, sensations, which are elements in order of actuality, which, you know, the ostensible things have in common as elements in the order of actuality. Um, because that's what they're pointing down to, is, you know, elements in the order of actuality, which, you know, are identical in the realm of respect. And so the first part of that discussion where I was, you know, expressing worries about that are connected with worries about whether, you know, the two fingers meet. I think they're related issues. Oh, you've stated the problem beautifully, but, I mean, the only thing I would dissent from, it's a mild dissent, is I'm not convinced he has any arguments. I mean, he has, he has, a, he has a this or nothing type argument, although um, he doesn't like arguments like that. When, and when Chisholm and Firth in favor of their 
traditional epistemologies say this or nothing. Seller says this is a terrible argument. You know, in other words, we were talking about this last year. I think his most like interesting argument is the external guidance argument in science and metaphysics, which I think is sort of C.I. Lewis inspired in a certain way. I don't think it works. No, I don't. So I disagree with you about the fundamental issue, but I think there is an attempt, sort of on transcendental grounds, to motivate the thought. That they must be. So it's not that he has, he's not. It's not that he just says, "Okay," and they meet. You know, he tries to motivate. I see two fingers left, and after those, we should move on to another hand. So John, you had raised on. one, and then okay. um, what? Well, actually, I don't know if this is going to be helpful. This, um, I wanted to say something that would partly line up with what Johannes was saying, and would um, leave the question <coughs> Michael was raising actually not urgent, uh, anyway not in the form in which he's raising it. Uh, and and um, uh, the way I think it's helpful to do this is to go back to thinking in Kantian terms. Right, so, so here's a, a, a right thing to say using Kantian language. Uh, you don't have to have a, an understanding in order to have sensibility, if we're thinking about animals, right? Animals don't have to have understanding in order to have sensibility. Um, Sellers has got a lot of stuff to say, and that's what Michael was pointing to, about um, how to understand <coughs> what sensibility might do for animals that have it and don't have understanding, yeah. and, and it, it's, it's kind of not irrelevant to their ability to hack it in, in their environment, to cope in their environment. Um, but now, uh, it, 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 just going on being a bit kind of Kantian, uh, when um, sensibility is present in an animal that has understanding, um, this strikes me as something like unproblematic, right? Um, uh, uh, the fact that we're talking now about animals that have understanding means that we're talking about animals such that the um, perturbations of sensibility in them are ah, um, conscious states and, and some sense conscious but um, it, 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 it isn't that there's some sort of deep issue about how uh, what in right mere brutes isn't because there isn't any question of consciousness uh, gets to be conscious um, it, it should be something like it's kind of obvious routine this is, this is the sort of difference that uh, being not a mere possessor of sensibility, but a possessor of sensibility. And I would say, use all the country kind of, in the service of understanding, but understanding is a power of knowing of a quite distinctive kind. Uh, uh, standings in the space of reasons, all that stuff. Um, uh, it, it, it needs sensibility to. to uh, and sensibility, it's clear now that sensibility is doing a different kind of thing, it, a kind of thing it couldn't do if it were simply loose from um, a, a, a concept of consciousness that is newly in play in this uh, new it might just, uh, not, it's not a big deal that it wasn't in play, this concept of consciousness when we were talking about um, everybody says animals as if we weren't animals, when we were talking about Mere, an mere animals. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, the idea that Sellers has some problem of, of explaining how uh, something that just is what um, perturbations of sensibility are in animals that don't have understanding, because somehow that's supposed to be still with us. How something that conforms to that description um, could somehow figure in an upward route that we're going to be met by uh, Jim's downward route. It isn't there. That's not what <coughs> perturbations of sensibility are for us. It's, it's kind of part of the point of those um, uh, um, cases of sensibility at work uh, that, that they aren't yet <laughs> um, within the scope of consciousness in a sense that's in play only because we are the special kind of animal that we are. Um, that leaves me still just not agreeing that the sense of impression well, inference is wrong. But, 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 um, I, 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 I really don't think this is a big deal. Um, uh, Jim, there's, there's two senses of meat that the fingers might meet in. One is, you could say, the downward arrow, we start with just these plain phenomenological facts that we have things present to us in this phenomenal way. That's what we're like. We give a nice description of us. 
And then we have this story, uh, you know, this sort of Millikan type story about tracking and all of this mm -hmm. stuff. And then we add to it the space of reasons and conceptual responsibilities. And they meet in the sense that we see that all of that rich stuff about us is one way of instantiating what we got building up. That's one sense. And, and there, I think, Sellers has, I agree with both of you, that it's not necessarily a convincing argument, but he has at least an argument trying to show that. But if that's all there is, then we, it just looks like, as it were, a lucky accident that we have the phenomenal stuff. A zombie could do it. A zombie that's in the space of reasons got merely a completely opaque state that, tr that tracks the environment in the right way and that commits it and then gets responded to and argued with and all of that would seem to be another possibility. Now, maybe Sellers is happy with that, but I take it that what Michael's point is is it, it, it would sort of be more satisfying if there was some reason why not just they met in the sense that totally phenomenally conscious critters like us are instantiations of knowers, but that we have to have all those elements to be knowers, and that's what I don't even see a purported argument but, but, for now. Well, I, I don't think the sellers things work, but I do think you're under-describing it in a way that also makes it less interesting. It is. So I don't, at the same time, think it doesn't work, but yeah, yeah. thinks that it's a really heroic attempt to try to do something, which seeing why it doesn't work is philosophically important. Okay, um, so, you know, um, so, so Johannes and I are kind of weird friends in this. We're both thinking it's really worth getting these details, but even if we don't quite agree about uh, so how, what but, but so first of all, the point is a lot. I mean, your picture was more like pointing at something, pointing up and trying to hit it. I, my pointing down figure was, was also moving down a lot. <laughs> okay. so, so, so there is a rather elaborate exercise, I think, starting from, you know, the full complexity of, you know, both <coughs> intentionally and sensually shaped, you know, phenomenal experience to pair off the sensory aspect of it. I think it's connected to some of the arguments that Bill's talking about. So we're looking at various kinds of cases of, you know, experiencing something pink and rectangular and trying to get at the pink aspect of all of them. And it's merely so, there's an attempt to, as it were, parse down to a notion of the sensory as such starting from this, con you know, from full-blown consciousness. So we're not just taking it as full-blown, we're trying to separate that aspect and these phenomenological arguments and various other things are meant to parse that out. I mean, whether they parse as finely as they want and the way they want is something we were discussing in the beginning. And then, the thing working up, the reason we call those elements in the tracking system sensations is precisely because they're supposed to, in some sense, ultimately emerge as, you know, identical with that thinnest aspect of the sensory aspect of our consciousness. And, and then I think he has an argument about why the thing that is co-describable in these two ways, as the merely, and this is, I think, so I C.I. Lewis inspired, you know, the merely as unalterable qualitative phenomenal aspect of consciousness stripped from all concepts and the thing that allows the world to get a voice in um, are two names of the same thing. If they weren't, the very concept of knowledge would fall apart. I don't think it's a good argument. I agree with that. But, but it is meant to be an argument that actually motivates the thought that the thinnest thing we got moving down from the up, from the high position, and the thickest thing we get kind of enriching, moving up, must, as it were, converge at this middle point. Because something we want of each turns out to be sort of, you might say, a common functional role they're playing in the two places, you know, hooking us to the world. Just so there's an idea of hooking to the world that you can get in one position or the other, and it's supposed to be the same thing. I don't think it works, but I think there's a lot more detail in this that re requires a story about... Um, you know, how we abstract from the unity of experience, which I wasn't hearing when you said. Sure. I think we should move on to the next hand, which is... Well, Jim, mine's mine's a different line. I'm happy to let a thousand fingers blossom before yeah? we come, because mine's a different line. Well, Matthew, no, I have no, some no, Okay, we postpone your hand for well, some more. Yeah. If you want to discuss that, okay. Well, I, just, uh, I just wondered about something John said a minute ago. Um, I, I mean, I like the structure of what you said, that, that, that 
the, the you know there's no project there, there needn't be any project to build up from you know the animal sensory awareness or something we have I I thought that the uh, question here was different it was it was a question about whether the story about sensations as merely theoretical entities yeah. could be related to the story yeah. about sensations as things right. we reach by abstraction mm-hmm. and what's right. consciously present mm-hmm. and now. I thought maybe you were you had some thought about the relationship between those two disputes, and I would be interested to hear it or something. That really somehow the, the in the in the idea of uh, sensory presence that is making the problem here. There is some implicit commitment to this other enterprise. No, you I, I shouldn't have even. <laughs> said the one more thing that I said, but now I've got to say one more thing. <laughs> um, um, I mean, uh, uh, unless, unless when you're in talking about sensations as theoretical, uh, you're alluding to uh, the myth of Jones, um, and then there's something in it, um, though you know, not just theoretical, he has to quickly say. I think the idea that sensations are theoretical is just wrong. On services part, um, they're not. Um, the talk of sensations is just talk of um, sensibility doing its thing. Sensibility doing whatever sensibility does in in the context, and and how to understand that is part of the question of of um, right, full blown experiencing. Uh, and the idea that that's theoretical. Uh, it strikes me as just awful, a bad, okay, that, that, a bad that's mistake. That's um, so, fine, so, but there, there, uh, is, there uh, is the instellers, as you admit, and a mm-hmm. yeah, project of sure. the bad kind. Right, um, right. And, but it, I mean, it all comes from um, the, the very idea. Um, I, I, I don't think Sellers calls the thing that Johannes <laughs> calls by this name uh, the sense impression inference. Um, in Sellers, it's supposed to be an inference to the claim that. There are sensations when uh, one uh, has a e.g. visual experience, um, and that's supposed to be an inference. And the idea that it's an inference strikes me as a misunderstanding the, the way the idea, of, um, as I was putting it, I mean, perturbations in sensibility um, uh, um, figures in a, in a coherent, sane. Um, <laughs> picture of, of, of what perceptual experiencing is um, experiencing has a sensory aspect that's not a theoretical claim that's all it means to, to talk about to talk sense anyway about sensations that doesn't sound right because I mean, to say that we have the sensory aspect. I mean, to talk about sensations is, is, is you're already implying that there's some kind of, uh, of of individuation identity that we can worry about the sameness of sensations. You can do maybe some mm-hmm. psychophysical stuff, and, and merely talking about a sensory aspect just doesn't even begin to address that. So there there is a difference Great. between talking about sensations um, as you know entitative or maybe there's states of things, but but in any case they've got uh, you know, they're distinct from each other in various different ways, etc. That's more, there's more going on there than just talking about a sensory aspect. Right? It's, it's spelling that out in some way. <coughs> Talk of sensations uh, inherits its um, uh, kind of individuative and, and etc. Uh, shape from talk of experiences, uh, which is, um, they're not really super well behaved individuals' experiences. But, but, um, uh, um, so, so you may talk of a sensation when you may talk of an experience because the experience will have a sensory aspect uh, and, and it's going to be a complex sensation that you're thereby allowed to talk of um, furthermore you may talk of a sensation in respect of each um, uh, sensible that is in there in the content of the experience um, there isn't some sort of autonomous thinginess <laughs> that attaches to items that we allow ourselves to talk about under that head 
But this is miles away from service. I, I, yeah. Jim, Jim, yeah. Just yeah. by way of the project of diagnosing what's driving sellers. So it's interesting that it, one of the things that's really driving them that doesn't drive us at all is um, has nothing to do with non-veridical perception. But just already, if you analyze the uh, you know colored objects, there's supposedly a deep problem which he sympathizes with about how to fit the ultimate homogeneity of, of this expansive pink. John yeah, groans at the mention of the grain argument. Yeah. No, it's not just, I don't think it's not, and it might not be trivially related to your needing to self-diagnose about the uh, common, so what you get is on his view already just trying to analyze what it is to be a physical object is an expansive pink a soup of pink that isn't integratable into the to the physical world and then the modern period without necessarily considerations of non veridicality moves that into the mind uh, in tells you that doesn't help he's probably right about that but then um, where to put the soup of pink and then it gets worse when you got two of them, it's true, if you press, <laughs> press your eyeball, but it, 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 that's a real problem. So it's already supposed to be a problem, and I've always thought the way to stop it is, is uh, if it can be done, is in, the, is in the first. So then diagnosing that, do you feel any, do we feel any pull to this question that there's any problem with integrating the expanse, color expanses into the physical world and uh, then when Seller says um, uh, in the Karis lecture say of course there are expanses of pink we need to inter integrate the cube of pink we got to recategorize it we got to kick it around all over ontology and it ends up at the base um, so it, it might not just be the problem of non veridical right. perception and, and maybe the view of Veridical perception that doesn't have a soup of pink that can't fit in will help with the problem of, of the. Yeah, I was really hoping no one had raised that question. I mean, it, you know, the grain argument, I've, I've busted my head over that for way too long. And, uh, I, and I, I, I must admit, it, 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 I don't feel its force. But take the account of perception. Uh, but take, but take the I, account of perception sensible qualities. I mean, we've talked about what animates sellers on this. It's, yeah. this. it's that there are these sensible qualities which are expanses of pink, which don't fit in. And, and then the, when you get to the problem of, of then there's, if you say there's no grounds for that, which I'm very sympathetic to, rejecting the grain, I mean, I reject the grain argument, but then what remains of the, whatever your account is of perception in the veridical case that doesn't have problematic pools of pink, might help then with the fitting the um, the other with the phenom aspects of the phenomenological principle that make it hard to fit them in in the non veridical That doesn't give you the solution, but I mean, it's it's if you talk about what animated sellers, that's the primary thing that animated sellers even even before getting to the non veridical case. I mean. Yeah, I think yeah he he took. He really believed he was onto something with the grain argument that there really was a, uh, a major problem here, and, and, and yeah, if, if you don't get it, um, then there's a whole bunch of things that 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 seem strong motivations to him that just you sort of say what, uh, and yeah. So there's a certain kind of informational. There's a certain kind of relationship in the veridical case that if it doesn't involve plants being pink being problematic in the way that has these properties that are supposed to uh, uh, be, have an intrinsic quality that's un it might ha help with that problem I think I mean the, re the reason he thought it was a problem is it's already a problem because um, you've, you've got these quanta of, of color that aren't gonna that aren't gonna fit in now that seems to me just false on the first step. So anyway, it's a different consideration. There's no no aspect of non politicality well, motivated in that. One of the things I was sort of hoping would happen here, but hasn't, 
is we do more talking about the cubicity rather than the pinkness. I mean, pinkness has been sort of beaten to death uh, in Solarzian discussions, but I'm not sure we've actually really done full justice to the notion that, you know, we see a, a, somehow supposedly a cube of pink in physical space is there. And, and so I, uh, that's why I wanted to, you know, frame it not in terms of pinkness, but in terms of, of space and time and, 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 and perception. How is the space there? And, you know, he actually has that whole appendix in, 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 in science and metaphysics on, on time. He, he obviously spent a lot of time worrying about just how time shows up for us and, and shows up in us. And would you way. agree the only reason he's worried about cube is because he's first worried about pink, right? The only reason he objects to adverbial theories that just talk about pink is you've got to talk about expanses of, of pink. So Volumes of pink, yeah. yeah. Well, right. So if it's not a problem. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm not going to help here. But, but I, thought I, just, uh, I thought I'd just kind of point something out about different issues. I mean, it, it's, I, 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 I admit I don't, I'm not moved by the pink ice cube business either. But it seems to me it, what, what moves you, I mean, part of what moves you has to do with larger ambitions of sellers that have to do with the two images and how they connect. I mean, you know, it's not, it's not as if within the manifest image um, it blows our mind, their expanses of pink. Right. It's, it's only once we're trying to go binocular and think the two images together. That's right. That we have a, right. And, and so if, if the whole picture of what the two images are and how they're connected and what it is to align them seems problematic, mm. then that problem's going to fall away. Whereas the problem we were talking about before, which mm. also has to do with sensation, and I admit these all come together in cells, yeah. but the problem we were talking about before where sellers is trying to um, connect the notion of sensation we can bootstrap out of, you know, imminent reflection of the character of experience with the notion of sensation that can hook us into the world in and a way the whole point that of seems the free of right. attentionality. Yeah. That's a worry which I think he thinks is motivated by thinking through the Kantian project the way he tries to, which is not to say it's the right way to think it through. So he thinks, you know, it belongs just to the manifest image that if we reflect on it, we realize that concepts are things that come to, from us, you know. Um, the truth in psychological nominalism is that we have to classify things in certain ways, but we don't want these ways we classify things just to be, you know, how we carve up the world. We want them to be anchored in some sort of way on something which guides our classification so they get better and worse. How are we going to tell that story of Anchorage? We need to have the world itself guiding these things in the right way. For our own manifest image picture of knowledge to work, we need to be able to hook up the intentional and the sensory in the right way. And he thinks he needs to pull this off in order to, as it were, vindicate our entitlement to our manifest image conception of ourselves as knowers. I don't think he's right about that, but uh, the details of how he thinks he know, needs to do it. But that starts from a much more just Kantian picture. Well, I mean, we I have agree. a theoretical kind of capacity. How do we make sense of it? We don't have to like have first-order physics that gives us a different image and put these things next to each other in order to to, to kind of get sold on Sowers' project. And so if you do want to say something is wrong with Sowers' project, then I do think you need so to be able to say in a kind of clear way how we can vindicate our but credentials without getting into that. I should say I agree with Johannes and that this thing's generatable from within the manifest image and the problem that we've all been talking about. But it's just that I think when Mike say asks, where, where does Sowers come by the idea that, that these basic kind, kinds of tracking relationships to do with sensations um, aren't enough and that they need, need this extra bit. I think he's got premises from elsewhere that, that shape uh, the way that he, that he has to fill in further bits. I, I agree with you that he... I agree these it. problems converge. I was I just know. saying why we could find he's the one more compelling. And I think one of the, yeah. one of the yeah. other yeah. things that he has in the back of his head since he was always a committed realist, uh, he wanted to be able to accommodate the idea that when we see the pink ice cube, we see its very pinkness. And that, you know, that phrase keeps coming back, it was to yeah. see its very pinkness. And, and so the, the way in which, as it were, the, what the pinkness is present to us can't be merely representational. It can't be, you know, I don't see uh, the very, um, I don't know, what would be the, the, the 
the very metalness of, 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 of the, the table legs or something like that. That's something that I have to get at in some other way. But I see the very pinkness. And, and, and somehow that, that has to be held. Uh, that's a basic thing for him, I think. And, You're doing and that, a good job of channeling him. <laughs> <laughs> and but that's also connected with his with his idea that that well we've really got the, the world we grasp once we've gotten our concepts straight is the world that is. Yeah, well, of course. I mean, just because this is an interesting point that connects our Kantian <coughs> discussions, I think that we have this thing in, in Jim's talk, for instance, about constitutive. Um, situative um, categories and uh, 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 consensus um, principles, principles and those which are um, regulative but necessary for experience like the other analogies and this um, corresponds to Kant's distinction between the mathematical and the dynamical categories and um, this the, 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 the talk about the very presence, blah blah blah, sets in in, in set us exactly where the mathematical categories are required, mm. and it doesn't um, affect right. what he has to say, what, what we have to say about uh, when, when we have to say about things when we apply the dynamical categories of but causality and dispositional uh, questions and so on. So there is something here that. Mirrors something that is in Right, I don't see the very solubility of the salt, exactly. mm -hmm. but I do see its very whiteness. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what my, my image models only adhere to the mathematical categories, right. and only if we see, uh, if we refer this Ooh. image model to uh, something out there, out there, when we, say, when we, when we uh, take it as being an object out there in space, it has causal and dispositional properties. So you think the, the image, image models are... Have, image models do not have causal and dispositional properties, they may have really extensible properties. But can't we and animate them? No, we, as soon as we animate them, we have to sort of envisage them as something existing independently from us in space and time. We can walk around. We can walk around mm, image models, that. but we can walk around objects in space and time, and that's what we image model, take image models to be. But image models are essentially perspectival, for instance, and mm -hmm. objects in space and time. Hmm. Now there would be time for your hand, Jim, or no, no. was it the hand? That the, the, hand. the pinkness, brain <laughs> argument business. Okay, that was the hand. Okay. Early on, Michael, you raised the hand. No, that was my hand. One of your many finger I, Jim has made a very useful supplement. I mean, yeah. I mean, the real problem, I think, with coming to terms with salad is, and it just comes out in, uh, John, for example, just doesn't take a lot of problems that Salas thinks are problems to be problems. In fact, he said, I don't think in a way John and I really disagree about this bottom down top of uh, top down bottom up stuff. John said it's just a mistake in fact and, uh, so it's, it's already a solution to something that John doesn't think is, uh, it's raising a dust. Uh, yeah, well Jim thinks I, I think there's a third element though about this meeting um, and, I mean my difficulty is to see how any one thing can do all the, thi all the things it's supposed to do Jim brought in the, the clash of the images and then the other thing that comes out very much in a lot of sellers is, um, which is why I think he's not quite happy to talk about the way sensibility is in us. I mean, maybe he should be, but I think it's a reason he isn't. Um, he's very concerned in philosophy and the scientific image of man not to see a discontinuity between the human and the rest of even the animal world um, uh, and yeah but I mean but I think his sense of what would constitute the discontinuity is not the same as as yours and so I think a third thing that Jim's finger pointing up <laughs> is supposed to do is to as it were fill in all the gaps in the great chain of being so to say so that uh, you know what you get from starting at the top by abstraction and, and what you get by building up 
uh, from the animals or even from the robots that he talks about in a lot of his papers you, you make it meat and then the last refuge of special creation as he says about the human is no longer a worry that's his phrase I mean and, <coughs> and, you know, if you don't share that complex of metaphysical intuitions that Sellers I think certainly has with, with, with the presence of the pinkness and uh, the, the, the worry of discontinuities then it's very hard to sympathize with him wanting an apparatus that solves all the, you know, he, he's, got, he's juggling a lot of philosophical issues in the air at once and I, I, I think some of us here, John thinks that some of them just don't deserve to be in the air and, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and then some think maybe they do but sellers drop them you know, right? <laughs> and, but, I mean I think <laughs> we can put the, pull the last two sessions together a little bit more closely by saying I think a lot of them were in the air in John's talk. I mean, it depends what it is to be in the air. Um, um, but they were in the air for a while. That is, I mean, if some of what's at issue with these two pointing fingers is Sellers, I'll put this very abstractly, in a way that is not, you know, faithful to the tale of Sellers, but can connect the two talks so something was in the air in both discussions. Um, something Sellers thinks we need. I mean, what's interesting, maybe I'll start in different places, Sellers has a reading of Kant that up to a point is strikingly reminiscent of the one John was giving us. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is, we have a story about sensory consciousness in which we are not going to be able to understand what it is for an intuition to have the kind of content it does unless it's a this such. And we're not going to be able to understand what a this such is unless that's an exercise of a capacity that is part of a bundle that includes the capacity of judgment. So we also can say this is a such and such. And so even though it's there, you know, being apprehended non-predicatively, that capacity to thus apprehend the thing non-predicatively requires the capacity for predication. So, I mean, there's a lot in Sowers' story as the finger has moved this finger I had in my answer to Mark moving down has moved quite far down but we're still as it's moving down into you know an examination of sensory consciousness still in completely McDowellian territory yeah, but, I, and he can, but then it, he wants it to push down to a point where he can say as long as we only consider that as long as we only have a McDowellian level degree of drilling down yeah. um, we um, stand under a threat that um, the forms of mindedness that we bring to the world um, aren't appropriately guided by the world. I think he has some worry like that. So he thinks we need to drill down to a point where we, un we, can, we can identify the sensory as contributing, shall we say, a voice to the outcome in the exercise of our kind of capacity that hasn't yet been infused or infected or informed by the understanding. So, that idea is very similar to the idea that we're left with when we have the deduction read halfway in the talk we had this morning. I mean, the talk read halfway involves the idea there is some conception of, I mean, it depends how you understand it, but there is some conception of sense functioning as a genuinely cognitive capacity um, you know, in some sense, at a remove from the sensory manifold informed by the understanding, which could introduce that independent voice in the outcome without threatening a problem. And the point of the argument of second half induction, as John was presenting it, is no, that's not going to work. If you try to give sense an autonomous voice like that, then by the time you bring in the understanding, it's going to come too late yeah. for us to have a coherence. So uh, it's all true, but the guidance, Jim, in science and metaphysics is bound up for sellers at the end in a way it never would be for John. No, no, with I, the I, transcendental I, scientific I, realism and everything. You're, I think you're mistaking the way in which I had something come in here. The target yeah. of John's talk yeah. is related to the thing in Stellar's we're rejecting here. Yeah. So that's the sense in which they're both in the air. So it's not that John's just saying this doesn't interest me. Oh, no, I didn't and think that. No, okay, right. He said it's a mistake many times that mm -hmm. Sellers makes to, to join issues, which some of which John thinks, I'm speaking for John, shouldn't be, some of which John thinks are perfectly genuine, some of which he does not. I mean, he actively... Well, I'm changing the word okay. mistake to a rather deep temptation. Or something like that, which is at the center of that reading of 
the transcendental deduction to ward off. Uh, I was quoting the yeah. state. Yeah. 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 Right, no, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's not any old mistake. So, I mean, there's a, the, the, the talk to join at that point. It seems. Any other finger or hand? I don't see. Oh, there you see. Yeah, well, I, I, um, that's something I, I, I just would like to to, um, to ask Bill about. I mean, in your paper, you have this criticism of of. Um, John's view about um, the reality and at the very end, I mean, for this is page 11, following. Um, perhaps, but isn't it a difficulty that in the of view all the supposedly general qualities inform the intentionality of intuition so that we bring in the author drop not just a view from specification of what the item is of the author where everything in vocabulary is proper and common sensible sensations end up having no content at all um, I'm pushing McDowell to it's a dilemma here our sensations can be equally both spatial and say colored or they end up empty and useless I, I since this was not the way I read John's paper I just wanted to bring our attention to that and maybe hear what, what John would have to say. Right, don't ask me. Yeah, well, I think, uh, I mean, you could maybe clarify your criticism as well. I, I, I'm not sure. What I'm no. I mean, he tells us that, that uh, we can abstract away from the cubicity because the cubicity informs the intention intentionality of the intuition then but as I say you know, this is for arriving at a specification of and now I will say right. um, the sensory aspect of right. experiencing uh, in Jim's top down way right right so so um, it, it's a way of arriving at a specification of something um, in connection with which we can say okay now we've got it specified uh, in such a way as to conform to Kant's <coughs> characterization of sensations, modifications of the subject's state. Um, so, um, and, and the way I, I take that, this was the exhaustively characterizable bit, was um, uh, um, not conceived as um, um, cases of Brentano intentionality. Um, 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 perceptual intentionality a la, a la, I don't know what I can't come from school but not, con, not, not conceived uh, as that mm. um, uh, I know that's uh, that's what I, what I was trying to do um, something I can't process in Bill's description of what I was trying to do is um, um, the talk of me as and I can't remember now where this is, finding a point in the idea that sensations are actually coloured. Um, that's a bit further on. That's on page 12. Um, I, I, I find no point in that idea. Um, I mean, it, it would have to be the idea that um, under enough of an abstraction so that we're thinking of experiencing uh, in, in a way that conforms to Kant's specification of sensations, um, we, we've arrived at something that we're conceiving as colored. Mm -hmm. No, we're not. We've arrived at something that we're conceiving as all oh, this or that oh. color. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm sorry about the mysteriousness to you, the idea of a vestigial use of the old of <laughs> intentionality. Um, I, I, you actually quote, I, mean, I didn't have my text, but you quote the bit. Um, yeah, you use the word um, vestigial. But, but, but you quote the bit that's meant to be an explanation of why I say vestigial. I mean, it's intentionality, all right. We arrive at these specifications by leaving out something that would need to be there if the um, role of the color word in the description of the thing, sensation of red, were, as in this use of it, um, uh, uh, a specification of a sensible that is 
perceived or ostensibly perceived <laughs> to characterize something and if we leave out um, cubic uh, we've left out what it would take for, for that to be intelligibly the role of the color word um, the descriptions yielded by the abstraction now this is me quoting you quoting me right um, uh, um, bottom of page 12 and on to page 13 the descriptions yielded by the abstraction Omit the context that would be needed if the colors they mentioned, as in right sensation yeah. of red, were to be figuring in them these descriptions as apparent qualities of external well, I, I So they're not figuring as that, and that's how these um, specifications arrived at by abstraction, which uh, um, are still specifications of experiencing, uh, um, don't contain in material to fix it but the um, uh, mentions of sensibles <laughs> that figure in them after, the, after this all um, are mentions of sensibles uh, in view in these descriptions as perceived or ostensibly perceived to characterize perceived or ostensibly perceived things I'm oh, sorry that's just uh, there's another thing about I'm not, I'm not advocating for this, but just to advance the conversation, I think. I mean, so, uh, uh, I, I mean, if I, if I engage in this process of abstraction, you, you know, and I try to focus on the, you know, sensory uh, aspect of color perception, um, uh, I can introduce by analogy a, a word for attribute of a sensation. Uh, you know, sensation of red. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, now you might think that it's equally attractive to think that I can introduce by analogy um, uh, some spatial language and characterize yeah. this. So, I mean, the, yeah, the, that red mm -hmm. in the yeah. it's shape Good. in the, the, quite the visual right. field yeah. or whatever, you know. Right. Right. Because it, it isn't, this is a, a thing to say instead of uh, the idea that we need to introduce. Uh, uh, properties of sensations which are my, uh, um, when Bill accuses me of trying to make room for sensations to be coloured I'm not doing that right. um, the, 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 the way the colour words function in sensation of red uh, is as words for a certain visible property of some things a, certain, a, a property that some things can be seen to have uh, that's all. That's the only significance that red has. Uh, um, uh, something uh, 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 starting with a perceiving <laughs> or ostensible perceiving that something has that property uh, and leaving out a bunch uh, we can get to a specification that's still of that same thing um, where, where this specification does not contain uh, enough to fix it that what the, the, the color word is doing in there is uh, um, introducing a visible quality a, 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 a quality seen or ostensibly seen to, to characterize some seen or ostensibly seen thing yeah, no, and then that's my, that. my, my, my shot at saying uh, aha so here we have a, uh, by Jim's down, uh, uh, top down uh, abstraction a specification it's important that it still is a specification of the, of the experiencing the whole shebang uh, right but um, such that the thing is now in view as conforming to Kant's characterization of sensations yeah so, so no analogical um, uh, it, it's the very thing uh, um, so the, the presupposition of your question was why not introduce analogical shape concepts I'm not in the business of introducing analogical concepts I have to leave out the, the shape concepts um, because of, I'm, I'm working within the scope of, of a thing that Sellers finds in Kant and complains about uh, that uh, spatial concepts uh, characterize um, how, how things are perceived to <coughs> Uh, um, and so it says that he ought to be thinking of spatiality as a form of sensibility as such uh, but this, this is thinking of spatiality as a form of um, 
sensibility informed by the understanding. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying, yeah, that is how Kant uh, conceives of spatiality in the end when you think things through. Um, we don't need a form of sensibility as such as well. Um, but um, still, uh, we can get into kind of non-null specifications by an abstraction uh, of, of um, what are in fact experiencings, perceivings or ostensible perceivings. Yeah. Uh, that we can recognize as specifications of sensations in Kant's sense. We, 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 we probably shouldn't talk of sensations as if they, they were seriously thingy. Um, so capturings so. of the sensory <coughs> aspect in a way that lines up with yeah. what Kant says uh, the, the products of sensibility are. Right. No, I mean, mainly mm-hmm. I just yeah. wanted to bring out this, this difference. I mean, I, mm-hmm. but, but, well, that's what but I, I wanted to bring out. I mean, could you say a bit more about why space drops out in the, 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 you know, greenness doesn't? <coughs> in, this, in this process of abstraction, we, we, we set aside space. Um, here's a, here's a, a roughly Kantian thing to say. Space is the form of outer sense. Um, Sellers complains um, uh, the question is whether it's a complaint but he's right about what he poses as a complaint all Kant gives us to mean by that uh, is uh, space is the form of outer sense informed by the understanding Jim is are you going to help? Well, I mean, I think it should be put something like this, isn't it? It's like when Kant gets around to talking in detail mm-hmm. about things he calls the form of outer sense, mm-hmm. it turns out That's to what be yeah. space. And space yeah. mm-hmm. turns out to be, if we think about it carefully, only the form of something which is informed by the understanding. Yeah. Therefore, there's something Kant should have been meant to be talking about, which yeah. is the form of sensibility as such, which mm-hmm. is actually fail to talk about. I mean, something like that is like the worst of so, but but anyway, the thing is that the, 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 um, the role of Q uh, in, in the starting point, right? <laughs> intuition of a, a translucent pink Q, uh, belongs there. Um, um, that's a spatial concept, sure. Um, that, the, the spatiality um, that there is in uh, that use of that spatial concept is not uh, the spatiality that Sellers complains that Kant doesn't elaborate. That's the spatiality that he complains that Kant exclusively focuses on. So uh, if you want a specification of what is in fact that item, an intuition of the translucent pink cube, um, that um, stands a chance of describing it as a, a mere modification of the subject state, which is supposed to exclude uh, Brentano intentionality yeah? you've got to leave Q out of what you say it's of and that consideration does not apply to uh, pink and translucent one final thing here Mark no it's, it's time it's ok time. <laughs> then <laughs> I guess it's time to close the session and let's thank you <laughs>
I'm not sure about that. Yeah, and then this part is no, I just meant like so if you're here, I'm not bought if you're here. Maybe you just said you didn't work on it.